Uh, yeah, so first, thanks for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Richard Maddock, and um, I'm from Foster and Partners. I'm an associate partner there over in London. And we are a large global architecture firm. We've been around for about 50 years. And uh, the tagline on the website is we do everything from door handles to cities. And that includes bridges and offices and uh, schools and health facilities and things like that. Um, the founder, Lord Norman Foster, has won the Pritzker Prize for Architecture um, and the firm has won many prizes for its work. So it's good being involved in such a large practice of about 1,500 people. 80% of those are in London and the work we do is incredibly varied. I'm a member of the Specialist Modelling Group and we are a sort of uh, in-house specialty team. We are design consultants to the architects. We help out when things get interesting or difficult or tricky. And we're a group of about 25 people and we're misfits, sort of. Uh, we all have a background in design, but we're all experts in something else. You know, we have mathematicians, geometers, acousticians, engineers, material scientists, computer scientists, that sort of air of expertise that does dovetail nicely with the work we do. My own background is I studied engineering, I did computer systems engineering and then worked for about 10 or 12 years as a software engineer before going back to university and studying architecture and ending up where I am today. So everything I'll be showing you today has only been possible because of our digital literacy. Within the group we have three areas of expertise. We do building physics. This is things such as computational fluid dynamics. Uh, we model wind flow and turbulence and heating and thermal comfort. This is also, uh, we do daylight analysis, um, solar studies and the, uh, the acoustics of various spaces. The other thing we do is design and geometry. And this is more my area of expertise. We do complex geometry and we dovetail nicely with the in-house engineering team to try and make things stand up in a nice and elegant way. And the third thing we look at is research and innovation. And this is what I'll be talking about today. This is where we look at things such as 3D printing. Um, we, we have uh, various concrete printing, metal printing projects on the go. But I'll be talking about two today in particular. And one is uh, space frames and bone structure, and the other is designing for another world. So space frames were invented around about 100 years ago by Alexander Graham Bell, who also invented the telephone. And he was one of the pioneers of flight. He was one of the early flight pioneers, and he was interested in kites, and he wanted to fill a volume with structure, but in a lightweight manner. He needed these things to get off the ground and so needed them to be nice and light. And when you look at some of these photos, it's a bit hard to tell whether they are photos from 100 years ago or just modern day hipsters having a laugh in the park with a nice Instagram filter, but I'm assured these are genuinely old photos. And of course, if you are an amazing inventor, you always get a photo of you laying one on your wife, holding your invention. This guy's a bit of a legend, I think. Then we move forward to the 50s, and uh, Conrad Wachsman had a project for a, um, I think this was an aircraft hangar for the US military. And you can see how space frames are very good at efficiently spanning long distances without requiring columns. Sadly, this was never built. And at Foster and Partners, we've used space frames on many of our projects. This is the Sainsbury Center from the 1970s. And you can see the large internal gallery space that is column free, so it's very flexible. This is Beijing Airport from about 10 years ago. And we have Mexico City Airport, which is due for completion in a couple of years. And you can see it has up to a 100 meter clear span, which is quite extraordinary. And if they build this properly, which hopefully they will, this project will be amazing. But you can see how there's a regularity of members and connections. And that was all very well and good for the 20th century when you could mass produce things that were exactly the same. But in this uh, modern, para uh, modern paradigm, when you can have things that are different and it doesn't really matter in terms of cost, how could we try and take this space frame technology 
and make it more, more efficient? How could we improve it? So the question is, what else fills a volume with stuff but smart stuff? One answer to that is bones. Bones have been studied for quite a while. These are some, uh, uh, an engineer and a mathematician from the 19th century were looking at bone structure. And when you look to the inside of bones, you can see that it has a lightweight foam-like structure. And that's found within the marrow space of bones. And these trabeculae respond to their local mechanical environment. They align themselves to directions of principal stress. And in regions of higher stress, there are more trabeculae. So what trabeculae do is they efficiently fill the volume of the bone with support structure. And we know this because of some very interesting experiments done on chickens. If you take a chicken and make it run on an, sorry, walk, not run, on an inclined treadmill for around 15 minutes a day, uh, for about two or three weeks, when you then look at the internal bone structure of that chicken, you can see that the angle of the trabeculae changes according to the angle of that inclined slope. That means bone is dynamic, it is constantly changing. You have these little critters called uh, osteoclasts and they resorb bone. They're constantly eating away at the bone and then replacing it. There's obviously a lot else going on in terms of uh, blood cells and fat cells and proteins and things like that. But bone is constantly changing. So the question is how can we learn from this? If we want to try and replicate this, we need something that locally varies density and alignment and anisotropy. And one thing that does this is ellipsoids. If you take a sphere or a ball and stretch it in one direction, you get a sort of a rugby ball or American football shaped object. And you can see how these things have a direction. They point in a certain way. And you can also vary their size. You can make them bigger or smaller. So these might be something we could employ to do what we need to do. If we take, for example, a simply supported beam. This is supported on two ends. Oh, where's my clicker? No. They heard here. Oh, it is there. Great. Terrific. Wonderful. So we have this beam supported on two ends, one end here and one end here. And if we put a simple load in the middle, we might get a deflected shape. This is obviously quite exaggerated, but that beam would begin to deflect down very slightly like that. And if we then analyze that volume, analyze that, that beam and figure out what the stress field is within it. And then if we were to fill that volume with these ellipsoids, and if we were to tell them, go and align yourselves to that stress field, figure out where you are, figure out the stress field at that location, and make yourselves point in that direction. Also, when the stress field is higher, make yourselves smaller. When the stress field is lower, make yourselves bigger. Let's see if we can just play that once more. Maybe not fine. But you can see in the areas of higher stress, there are more of these um, objects, these shapes. And in regions of lower stress, there's fewer of them. And if we were to take the centroid of each ellipsoid and map its progress as this process happens, you can see how they gather down in those bottom corners and up in the top where the load is placed. And if we then connect those centroids, we get something that looks a little like this. So this uh, topology, this network, is adapted to the forces that that beam experiences. And if we were to compare that to a sort of simple, naive space frame, we can see that the buckling factor has increased, the deflection has decreased, and the amount of material has decreased as well. This is all very good. But what if we wanted to set the performance criteria, if we knew how much uh, deflection we wanted and we knew what our buckling factor wanted to be, what would that mean? So let's take this example of a uh, volume, a cantilever sticking up out of the ground. If we then analyze that volume for the uh, stress field and if we 
put our ellipsoids into that volume and tell them to bump up against, bump up against each other and sort of pack that volume and align themselves to the stress field and the forces, you get something that looks a bit like this. You can see them moving around and bumping around. And again, once you connect their centroids, you build up a topology, a network, that is responding to the forces that that volume experiences. So if we compare the one on the right, which is this uh, new mechano-adaptive space frame, with the one on the left, which is a naive, uh, regular space frame, the one on the right has about half as many nodes and uses half as much material. So we've saved quite a lot just by using this software and understanding the forces that that volume is sub uh, subject to. So this is some uh, software we've been producing in-house. Um, it is now open source. Um, it'll soon be available for uh, Grasshopper for Rhino, a 3D CAD program, and it's called Magpie. So keep an eye out for that one. So the second research project I'd like to speak about is designing for another world. And this research project has been going on for a few years now. Um, it still has another, I think, two years to run, uh, but it's been quite interesting. For millennia, humans have been fascinated with the stars and what is up there and out there. Gods have been created, wars have been fought, and lives have been lost, all based on the objects we see in the sky. This is the oldest known representation of celestial, celestial objects. It's in the Lascaux Caves in France, and it features three constellations, Pleiades, Taurus, and Orion's Belt. This was 16,000 years ago. But it wasn't until Galileo, about 400 years ago, that we had our first detailed drawings of a celestial body, the moon. This was in 1609, and his output marks the birth of modern astronomy. John Draper took the first detailed daguerreotype, so that was a precursor to photographs of the moon in 1840, and this was our first real look at what the moon was like. And of course, we're humans, and so we are fascinated by ourselves. One look at social media will provide ample evidence of that, and as soon as we were able to, we turned the camera back on us. This is the first photo of the Earth from space, taken in 1946. Dozens of V-2 rockets captured from the Germans after World War II were fired into the atmosphere above the New Mexico desert. Now, mostly packed with scientific instruments, um, the US were trying to perfect their rocketry technique and also decided to do some experiments as well. And someone decided to put a camera up there and they took some photos and this was the first camera that survived re-entry. This is the first photo of Earth. And Apollo 8 took one of the most important photos of all time. This is Earthrise in 1968, a year before the moon landings. And this helped spark the global environmental movement. This was our first view of the Earth as a globe. And this is another remarkable photo, this time of the lunar module lander on its way to the moon's surface in 1969. This photo was taken by Michael Collins, so in that capsule is Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin about to walk on the moon. But this photo makes Michael Collins the only person alive, or dead, or indeed yet to be born, who is not inside the frame of that photo. And of course we have possibly the greatest photo ever taken. This is known as Pale Blue Dot. Voyager 1 was launched in 1977 to explore the solar system. And the photos it took of the planets are truly spectacular. The swirls of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, that incredible blue of Uranus. And the scientist Carl Sagan had the idea to turn the camera around, to point it back at us. So this photo was taken in 1990. It's out of the edges of the solar system, it's out beyond Neptune, and it's a wide-angle view, and the sun is on the far right. It looks a lot bigger than it is because of uh, lens flare. And you can see those two sort of close-ups on the left, uh, or sorry, higher res images. On the left is Earth, and on the right is Venus. And if we look at the one of Earth, we can just see 
Just there is our pale blue dot. And I'd just like to quote Carl Sagan briefly. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is the only world known so far to harbour life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. Now, he wrote those words in 1994. Things have moved on since then. And so this research project, in collaboration with the European Space Agency and NASA, is hoping to remedy that by grappling with the problem of constructing habitats for humans on extraterrestrial bodies. So getting to space is quite easy. It's uh, not that difficult. You see um, articles in, in the press every now and then of some teenagers spend a few hundred dollars on a weather balloon, they attach a camera to it and they send it up and take some photos and back it comes. Getting into space is easy. Staying in space is the hard part. And the rule of thumb is you need around 10 times the payload weight in fuel to get that payload into just low Earth orbit. Because you have to go not only up, but you have to go sideways incredibly quickly. That takes a lot of fuel. If you want to escape Earth's gravity, get out of low Earth orbit. That is even more expensive. So if we are to construct off-world habitats, we obviously need a solution that doesn't rely on material from Earth. It's simply too expensive. And the problem with off-world habitats is that they are dangerous. Earth is relatively safe. We still need technology such as clothes and houses and things like that. But we can survive on Earth. It does protect us with its atmosphere and magnetic field. The moon does not do that. Mars does not do that. We need protection from radiation. We need protection from extreme temperature. We need uh, protection from meteoroids. And by far the best and easiest way to protect from these three things is with big, big, thick walls. And we can't realistically bring those walls with us. So we need something that is strong, and that can be built easily and quickly, using a minimum amount of local material. Evolution has obviously solved many problems before, so perhaps we could once again be inspired by and learn from nature. And if we look again at trabecular bone, we see that lightweight foam-like structure. And if we zoom in, and this is the fourth lumbar vertebra of a 41-year-old man, magnified 10 times, and you can see how it has that hollow uh, closed cellular structure. It's almost foam-like. And if we consider trying to turn this idea into a construction technology, then using this type of hollow closed cell structure will minimize the amount of binding agent we need by only gluing what really needs to be glued. So doing this will greatly reduce the 3D printing time and the amount of material that we need to bring from Earth. So this is how the concept for the lunar base was born. This is a collaboration with the European Space Agency uh, in 2013. And the idea is to send up this capsule and an inflatable dome will extend from one end of this cylinder. No one really says how the cylinder gets there from the lander, but, but it does. So once we have this inflatable dome, which is our living quarters when the astronauts finally get there, we take the local material, that moon dust, regolith, and we build it up over that dome using one of these uh, mobile robotic 3D printers. So it has a scoop on the front to collect the dust and you gradually build it up layer by layer. And then with that printing head, you only print 
what you need to print. You only glue what you need to glue. And so you can minimize the amount of gluing material that you need to bring from Earth with you. And you do this in a smart, clever way. So we designed the, the uh, geometry of this structure in collaboration with consortium partners D-Shape and the University of Pisa. And you can see how that, uh, those big thick walls, the, we worked out they need to be about a metre thick in order to keep out all the radiation and withstand meteoroid impacts and things like that. And this provides enough living space for about four people. The planned site for the base is at the moon's southern pole, where there is near perpetual sunlight on the horizon, as the moon is tidally locked to Earth. You know, the same side of the moon always faces Earth. And the idea is over time you could connect these pods and begin to build up a sort of uh, lunar base. And of course they are very nice, pretty pictures, but it's always more fun to do it in reality. So uh, we built one of these uh, mock-up pieces. This weighed one and a half tonnes. And we also did similar tests in uh, vacuum chambers just to make sure the technology would work in a vacuum. So a year or so after that, NASA announced a competition to design a 3D printed habitat for Mars. And this competition was in three phases. We've done the first two phases. The third phase is happening this year and won't be finished for another year or two. But I'd just like to talk briefly about those first two phases. So obviously Mars poses similar difficulties to the Moon, but it also provides an additional challenge in that it is so far away. It can take up to 20 minutes for a signal travelling at the speed of light to reach Mars from Earth. This means there's no way to quickly and easily control remote robots from Earth. Automation would be key. And what's interesting about this is the scale. If you imagine the Earth as the size of a golf ball, say about that big, uh, I live in London, but I'm from Tasmania, the other side of the world, Australia. So I know it takes me 24 hours a day to fly halfway around that golf ball. At this scale, the moon would be a small marble, and it's about 1.3 metres away, so something like that. Mars would be a larger marble, and it would be a kilometre away. Voyager 1, the most distant man-made object, would be a tiny, tiny speck, and it would be 70 kilometers away. So Mars is a long way away. Not only do we require local material as before, we also need these things that are going to build this habitat to be autonomous. And we also need some built-in redundancy. If one of them fails, the whole mission can't fail. So the idea is for the first stage to have a, a delivery of robotic system modules um, with various parachutes to bring them down to the surface of Mars. And then these robots would come out and start digging a pit for the base to fit in. You can only see one pit, but there are obviously many pits for these modules to fit in. The second stage is the same principle, but once the parachutes are disconnected, this thing would use airbags to roll around and navigate on the surface to put itself where it needed to be before finally opening up to have that inflatable habitat. And once the base is deployed and the modules are connecting, the robots start covering with material as before. And the idea this time is to have three different types of robots. We'd have a larger digger uh, robot, a uh, slightly smaller mover robot that would move that regolith around, and finally a very small melter. And so this would do the sintering of the regolith. And in a similar manner to before, we would simply, I say simply, layer up those regolith, you know, that uh, Martian dust to slowly cover those domes. And this is how it might look when the astronauts finally get there. You can see there are many robots. You can also see it's not finished. Um, the robots decided to prioritize two of the domes. 
And you can see that one dome is taller than the others, and this is a safety dome. It would be more resilient to spikes in radiation from solar flare and things like that. Inside, you'd have various pods and living spaces and research quarters. And the idea is to have a few of these modules plugged in together. And obviously, the psychology of the space is quite important. Um, you know, how do you try and make people feel at home in a place that is so far away from home? And not only would we be just be living there, but we'd be try we would want to be doing research and have a sort of collaboration with robots within the base. So this construction paradigm of redundancy requires a swarm of autonomous robots. The big question is how do you remotely control a swarm of robots from Earth? Well, you can't really do it. But once more, we could turn to nature and find a possible solution. There are lots of things on Earth that do manage to build things without having a leader, without having instructions. There's no lead termite with a set of blueprints telling the other termites what to build and where and how and why and when. But out of their collective knowledge, there emerges this thing which controls temperature and humidity and works for them as a home. They just have their own local rules that they know and they operate by, and out of that emerges this complex structure. And it's the same with the flocking of birds. There's no lead bird telling all the other birds where to fly and where to go. They just know, all right, don't be too close to my neighbour, but don't be too far away. If the one in front of me turns left, I might turn left as well. And out of these very, very simple rules, you get this incredible flocking behaviour. These are starling murmurations, which are quite exquisite to watch. And this complex behaviour is only the, only the result of simple rules applied across many agents. So this was first studied in the 80s by a guy called Craig Reynolds, and he wrote his eponymous Boyd's program. These little uh, critters, they only have four very simple rules. And when you apply that on a whole, you can see they exhibit this flocking behavior. This is very easy to program, but the result is quite interesting and quite complex. So we decided to follow those sorts of ideas and we designed our own robot and we took part in a uh, conference in Gothenburg two years ago, Smart Geometry, and we assembled those robots and we set them loose on a sand pit. And the idea was to imbue them with these sort of simple rules, these pathfinding algorithms and collision detection algorithms and gave them goal-based decision-making algorithms too. And out of that, we just sort of set them loose on the sandpit to see what they could try and do. We wanted to set them up so they would collect material from one place and deposit it in another place, but without a, an overarching instruction set, just something they would do on their own from their simple rules. And we also gave them, uh, you know, we, we took an idea of pheromones from the ant world. They would lay down these sorts of tracks when they found a good resource of food that would lay down a pheromone that other robots could then sniff out and realize that was a good source of uh, material and resource. And on the right, you can see that they would share knowledge of the world with each other. When one robot discovered a new part of the map of the terrain, that robot could share it with the other robots. And here you can see them uh, doing their thing. So that was phase one, design. The second phase is all about materials. And this was, uh, NASA set us and other teams the challenge of 3D printing three quite diverse shapes. The cone and the beam are very simple, and the third one is merely an arbitrary shape an engineer at NASA dreamed up that had enough uh, difficulties in terms of connections and overhangs and whatnot to make it fairly difficult to print. So we teamed up with Branch Technology and they are based in Chattanooga, Tennessee and they are specialists in spatial 3D printing. Uh, one thing to note about this video, it is very watchable but it has been sped up a lot. Sadly, it's not that quick. That would be amazing. 
But these guys, they print stuff in uh, space with a robot. And one of the interesting aspects of this competition was it was all about materials. It was a pure science thing. It was success or failure, right or wrong. And so the engineering of the materials played a huge part in success. Um, it was only about how much load each piece could carry. And you were rewarded if you were using materials that were found locally, such as basalt, and you were penalised if you used materials that weren't found, such as water. So we teamed up with a firm called Tecma, and they created this uh, unique material for us. I would love to tell you what it is, but not only am I not allowed, but I don't even know. So I think it's a very closely guarded secret, but it does have quite a lot of basalt in there. And we had to do a lot of tests on what the material makeup would be and also the shape of what we were going to print. And we looked at various ways of trying to optimise the shape and the structure and things like that. So these were tests for the, uh, that simple beam, which was supported uh, at the two ends and then a double load applied on top. So when we did these various tests and we analysed the thing, we realised that the corners weren't doing much work. So we thought we'd be really clever and we wouldn't print the corners. And we'd print this funky shape and that would be really good and we were amazingly clever. However, that wasn't quite the case. In this particular test, there was no time limit. So we could have printed for two weeks and they wouldn't have cared. So in retrospect, we probably should have just printed a solid beam and everything would have been totally fine. But you can see when it comes to actually testing the thing that it breaks right on the part we didn't print, uh, which is not so great. However, it's still, uh, so you can see, yeah, he's, here is the analysis and those top corners are blue, don't really do much work. Hey, who needs them? Well, it would be good if we had them there because it probably would have taken some more weight. It took six tonnes, which is still quite impressive. The cylinder print withstood 24 tonnes. And it was quite amusing because the uh, requirements of the competition were very strict on the size of these pieces. So this had to be a certain height. I think it was 300 mil. And it only had about 5 mil either way. And when we tipped the basalt into the middle, obviously the basalt has an angle of repose, so it has a nice little cone shape on top, which would mean the piece we printed was outside the bounds of the competition. So we attached a little broom onto this massive industrial robot, and at the very last, this robot would come along and just go whoosh, whoosh, and sweep off that top material, just to make sure it was perfect. But it is quite ridiculous to think of uh, this amazing robotic thing with just a little dust broom on the end of its arm sweeping off the top of this uh, basalt rubble. So the final piece is this one and this was a uh, live showdown. All the others we could print in a lab somewhere and send off to be tested. This was a live showdown at the Caterpillar Learning Centre in Illinois just south of Chicago. And the tricky part was you had to print on site uninterrupted. Just press a button and hope it all worked. And uh, that made it quite a technological, technological challenge as well. Our closest competitors were a consortium from South Korea and they were doing really good work but unfortunately their print run just didn't work. So they were ruled out of the competition. So it was quite a feat to be able to set this system up that you could press one button and walk away and just have everything printed in less than four hours. So we analysed that shape and tried to figure out where we should put more material. This time, because we did have that four hour time constraint, there was, uh, you know, we had to make that trade off of how much material we could deposit. And this is the, uh, well, what we finally printed. And then it's time to crush it. And this is the moment of failure, and you can just see it took about 1.6 tonnes before it finally failed, which was more than double the nearest competitor who actually got a piece up 
to be tested. What's interesting is you can see that it was actually a failure through delamination. It wasn't a material failure. It was the fact that those three arms were printed once the base had cooled. And also when that final cap piece was printed, the arms had cooled as well. So the material didn't fail. It was the joints of the uh, arms to the base that did fail. So there's work that can be done to improve that. Nevertheless, winners are grinners. And we also printed a uh, sort of space framey version of this. And you can see how the shape of what was printed has a uh, sort of star shape for some greater structural integrity. And finally, we applied the earlier technology to this NASA dome. And one of the difficult parts is sequencing. When you're printing with a robotic arm, it's quite difficult to print complex shapes. So one thing we need to do is work on how many uh, members come into that central node. So this concludes this uh, brief look at some of the work we do at the Specialist Modeling Group. And again, all of this is possible because of our diverse backgrounds and the interdisciplinary nature of what we do. But most of all, it's because of our digital literacy. Thank you.